it's great seeing so many uh, of you this morning. So I'll do a very brief intro so we leave more time uh, for valuable discussions. I'll tell you uh, what this event is about and uh, also uh, why do we do this? So, so this event uh, is a two day event. This is the first day, February 19th is the second day. So you see on the um, PowerPoint slide Kimberly put up, it says hero. Uh, most of you know what, what it's about. Uh, uh, for those who don't, uh, hero is, uh, stands for healthcare robotics. So a few years ago, uh, Professor uh, Goldina Jett and Professor Eric Diller, so mostly three of us uh, discussed the possibility of uh, applying to NSERC for funding uh, for a training program. It's not really a research program. It's called NSERC Create Program. It's for um, training uh, grad students and postdocs. So we applied and we made it. So our title was uh, Answer Create uh, Healthcare Robotics. That's why, HERO. So HERO, um, the, the purpose of doing this uh, program and today's event is to uh, create a platform uh, to tie our trainees in healthcare robotics together and also to let them interact, give them opportunities uh, to interact with industry, to tie faculty together, to have stronger cohesion. So I haven't told you uh, what hero healthcare robotics. Uh, I don't think healthcare robotics has a clear definition internationally, but uh, to us, healthcare robotics uh, has three pillars or three themes. One is surgical, the second is rehabilitation, the third is assistive robotics. So those are the three pillars or themes in our hero program. And that's the three areas uh, everyone uh, in today's event uh, works in one of them. So, so uh, that, that's the purpose of HERO and uh, briefly today's event, a uh, HERO Summit day one, we fortunately invited uh, half uh, uh, leaders from uh, uh, surgeons, uh, end users, industry leaders. And uh, I, very, uh, I very much look forward to learning as well, not only uh, our trainees, I also look forward to uh, hearing their discussion. Uh, let's uh, uh, let's uh, uh, pay attention to their views. Uh, a lot of you in the healthcare robotics course, MIE 1080, uh, we heard uh, uh, invited lecturers to speak to us about market assessment, about patenting strategy, about uh, uh, design issues. So we know that healthcare robotics involves more than technical aspects. So it's important for us to learn also from end users of robotic systems and also industry perspectives. Of course, uh, academic uh, technological um, uh, 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 contents are also important. So they will all show up today. I think it will be a great event. And before we get started, I, I need to, not a formality, I really need to thank uh, a, a few people in particular one is Kimberly, our today's uh, uh, coordinator, who did uh, almost all the work putting the program together. Kimberly is uh, our program manager uh, of Robotics Institute, working with all of us, and also with our associate director, Holly Siegel. I also need to thank uh, uh, Professor Rosalie Wong. Uh, I'll do a very brief intro. Uh, Rosalie is uh, from Toronto Rehabilitation Institute. She is an expert in rehabilitation robotics. And she also works with a large network of uh, therapists, with uh, uh, professionals, uh, and end users of uh, robotic systems. Our second host today, I need to thank, is Professor Animish Garg. So the, both of them, Animish is a, a professor in computer science, UTM, uh, Mississauga. So both are invaluable uh, members of our robotics institutes, among others. So without uh, further ado, I think I need to give the floor to Kimberly so we can kick off today's program. I look forward to it and hope uh, all of you will enjoy it as well. Thank well you one so last much. sentence, Kimberly, sorry, one last sentence. Uh, I need to say that uh, the pandemic becomes very boring and distressing. 
And uh, although pandemic separates us uh, physically, uh, all of us look forward to getting back to in the classroom to be together. But uh, I believe uh, our community, uh, healthcare robotics community and the larger robotics community is strong as ever. So I hope uh, uh, we all attend our events and exchange information and let's continue uh, to uh, go through this difficult time and boring time. So Kimberly, please. Thank you for that, that very heartwarming message. Um, and now I will, I will say some mechanical things. Dylan, if you could um, skip ahead the two slides to the Zoom links. Um, so uh, this is, as you notice, this is not in the webinar format. That's to increase the um, communication and, and uh, ability for us to have open conversation later in the day. But until then, and during the panels for the best viewing experience, if you make sure to um, uh, click the carrot next to start video um, and toggle hot, hide non-video participants, and then have your video off during the presentations, and then we can um, turn it on after the panels uh, and trainee presentations are over. Um, and if you do that also in gallery view, then you'll sort of get the same webinar effect um, and we have the best of both worlds. Uh, go ahead, next slide. Uh, and so we have our, our first panel is how might we maximize adoption of healthcare robotics in clinical settings? Uh, on behalf of Animesh, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our uh, panelists. Next slide. So first we have um, Vitor Mendez Pereira. Uh, he is a neurosurgeon specializing in minimally invasive procedures of the intracranial and spinal circulation and percutaneous spinal interventions for pain management. He's a professor of medical imaging and surgery at the University of Toronto and a staff physician at the Western Hospital and Hospital for, for Sick Kids. Uh, thank you so much for being here, Vitor. Um, and if uh, obviously the panelists could go ahead and leave their video on, that would be perfect, thanks. Uh, we're also joined by Tim Fielding. He's the product development manager for medical at MDA. MDA is, uh, I'm sure everybody knows, but just to make sure, it's Canada's leading space company and has uh, decades of experience with robotics for space missions. Tim has worked on applying know-how from space programs to medical robotics with a variety of academic and commercial partners. Thanks so much for joining us, Tim. Uh, and then finally, we have Amon Thind from Kanavi. He's the CTO and co-founder of Kanavi Medical. Kanavi Medical is a Toronto-based medical device company that provides catheter-based image guidance solutions for the interventional cardiology community. He completed a PhD at the University of Toronto in medical biophysics. Thank you so much, Aman, for being here. Uh, and without further ado, I will turn things over to Animesh Garg. Thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Uh, I think, uh, thank you, thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, this has been, uh, this would, I, I'm very much looking forward to, uh, uh, to the session. Uh, I um, am hoping that we will, uh, we will use this time today uh, in a format where first I would like to discuss and hear views on our pointer question, uh, where we have a very sort of broad, broad minded, uh, what you might call uh, a prompt, uh, how might we think about maximizing adoption in healthcare, uh, particularly for robotics in clinical settings. Uh, and, and then we can sort of start with a few questions that I have prepared uh, and hopefully uh, that will kickstart uh, us with questions from the audience as well. Uh, so with that, uh, let's maybe go left to right. Uh, maybe let's start with right. Uh, 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 and and uh, that would be a good five minute start for an opening sentence, uh, opening salvo from Vitor. Uh, so good morning, everybody. Thanks for the invitation to be here. Uh, it's my pleasure. And I'm also, as you, an enthusiast of robotics. Our current experience with robotics consists of uh, uh, developing and adapting an endovascular system to perform minimally invasive uh, brain surgery. So we have up to date completed uh, 21 cases of surgeries that we perform actually through the vessels 
and we can reach the uh, diseases and some vessels in the brain and then uh, we can uh, perform them almost completely uh, robotically. This has been a successful experience and uh, this was the first time that we could perform a brain surgery using robotics. Um, other robotic uh, activities that we do, we do a spine surgery that we have a robotic system to support the, the positioning of the, the screws. And we also have a number of diagnostic uh, tools. And lately, the most recent one has been uh, a Doppler, a uh, transcranial Doppler, which is an imaging that we actually have to perform manually and find a window to actually use a Doppler to assess the vessels intracranially through the bone. And now we have a, a system that we've been studying and assessing that uses robotics and AI to actually autonomously perform uh, the, the, the exam for us. And uh, I see robotics as a, as a partner in the clinical field. It improves our ergonomics and improves the precision of the procedures. And if I'm speaking how I see and how I use robotics right now, but uh, uh, to expand what we, we are doing already now, uh, I think the future, at least in the neurosurgery domain, will be to perform remote procedures. I think that will be actually what will improve and the access to procedures. We have some procedures that, depending on the time, to actually uh, be successfully and, and actually change and improve the clinical outcome of the patients. And we have countries like Canada with distances that are sometimes uh, impeditive to most of the procedures. And I think if we can, I see the future of robotics in neurosurgery, neuroscience, uh, in the surgical robotics, uh, expanding by adding remote treatment, remote diagnosis, tele telemedicine. And that's what I think the, the, the future is preparing for us in, in my, my domain. In medicine. That's wonderfully spoken. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, uh, Kimberly, do you want to uh, keep this uh, slides, uh, slide shared um, so that we can have uh, that up if you want? Uh, otherwise, uh, it may be just a uh, screen. Uh, so I think we'll continue. Um, so before we get into questions, of course, this is uh, the one key thing that Vitor sort of uh, mentioned this uh, uh, today, primarily is uh, that should, we should have uh, remote procedures, which is, um, which is actually uh, a very important sort of uh, uh, setup that uh, we uh, will have. This has guided a lot of um, uh, a lot of technology development over the years, and we will sort of revisit this uh, as we discuss uh, the kind of technologies uh, uh, that might be used for adoption. With that, I would like to sort of ask Tim uh, to express his views, um, and and uh, then we'll want to uh, move on to Aman. So, Tim, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, well for having me on the panel and uh, yeah, asking for some thoughts. Uh, Hello to everyone, and yes, this is an awkward situation for all. I think you said bo boring was one description of it. Yes, it would be great to get back and see everyone face to face. But for now, we'll deal with what we have. So thanks for thanks for having me. Um, yeah, th that was um, that was a really <laughs> a great kind of description of of um, you know some of the the, the promise that uh, that uh, robotics can bring to to healthcare. You know, in particular, precision uh, in neurosurgery. There's there's lots of promise there. Um, Neurosurgery is uh, uh, takes advantage of, of advanced imaging. Uh, it needs precision uh, for these uh, for these interventions, um, and um, yeah, and there's there's room for improvement. Um, and the uh, the aspect of of um, using like that imaging and, and like digital you know, digital technology allows you to um, to expand. Um, the, the reach of uh, and using robotics expand the reach from just a, a local having to be right there with the patient to potentially being able to do this uh, this all remotely. 
Um, there's all kinds of technology that's been developed over the years. Um, I've been lucky enough to be part of, um, of some of this uh, evolution over my career. From the 90s and even earlier, robotics is, um, uh, has had a lot of excitement around it, a lot of promise in healthcare. Um, but I think, you know, based on the, the topic of this discussion, it's, it's been slow coming. Um, adoption has been um, slow for a variety of reasons. And of course, we'll, we want to explore those a little bit in our, in our, our panel today. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, it's important to keep in mind. And I think Dr. Uh, Dr. Sun very early uh, on in the introduction talked about um, one of the keys and that uh, we have to keep focused on, it's, it's not just about the technology. I think uh, the group here is probably uh, believers in, in robotics and what it can do and the promise, but um, understanding why you would use robotics in a particular application and, and what value it brings. Uh, I think that's, um, that's one of the keys. That's one of the keys to, to uh, wider adoption. And then, of course, we have to keep uh, keep our eye on what barriers there are to that adoption. But um, but the first step is understanding the value that robotics can can bring. And uh, maybe I'll leave it there, and we can talk more about the, the the details as we get into the panel. I think that's actually a very good point as well. So I will sort of summarize Tim's point as uh, as if to to sort of have newer technologies, particularly in robotics, increasingly being used, uh, one of the things or one of the key challenges as technologists we need to solve is to justify value of this cutting edge technology. Uh, and this is, of course, in addition to what Mitra said, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the ability to do remote procedures. So over to you, Amma. Great. Um, well, thank you so much for, for having me. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to, to be part of this panel. Um, and you know, I think what uh, what Tim touched on um, is is very critical to um, how we can drive adoption here. Um, you know, the technology is absolutely a critical portion of it, but you know, you can have the best technology in the world, and there are several other barriers uh, that that we'll need to overcome. And um, you know, and I think one of the big ones is is psychological. I uh, you know. I, I recall having a conversation with, you know, a, a, a pretty high-ranking uh, executive at, at a medical device company, who, who, whose opinion was that as long as I'm alive, no robot will ever perform surgery on me. Um, and, uh, and and you know, there's there there are many aspects beyond um, the technology itself that uh, that are absolutely critical and. Uh, and uh, and necessary to discuss. I mean, uh, Vitor had spoken about uh, you know the 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 possibility of of remote um, you know uh, r remote surgical procedures, which is you know absolutely um, has huge potential for for field procedures. Either because you know there isn't there isn't time to to bring somebody into a, a traditional operating theater, or you're in. Um, you know, a, a, a remote part of the country and, and sort of, you, you know, the, the logistics of getting, um, you know, the, the, the trained surgeons up there is, is very difficult. Um, you know, there's, there's so much beyond, you know, there's, there's, there's huge technological challenges to, to developing that type of thing. But even beyond that, um, you know, some of the cybersecurity risks, for instance, um, you know, are, are other aspects that uh, are, are beyond sort of the core technology that are uh, potential impediments to, to to getting this type of thing um, up and running, um, and and there's I think you know everybody we probably wouldn't be here if we didn't if we didn't believe that uh, there's huge potential in in um, you know robotics for healthcare and any number of uh, you know the scope can can vary very, very uh, really broadly, um, but uh, no I, I look forward to the to, to the rest of this discussion to talk about. The technology and uh, and beyond uh, all the other sort of aspects that uh, that need to be considered. That's actually yet another sort of uh, pillar, according to me, uh, what Aman mentioned. In addition to uh, the existence of technology, which writer sort of uh, uh, mentioned, then there was justifying the value, and then the third part is actually how do we drive adoption to ensure, uh, particularly because you're operating in a uh, in a relatively conservative field where uh, doctors are taught to be procedural by design. 
uh, and not to change procedure uh, on the fly based on instinct. That is part of the training. So th this is sort of like they're at the complete opposite end of uh, operationalizing things compared to let's say technologists. So how do we convince doctors uh, to make the jump and what sort of procedures and, and let's say incentives should be created? So, okay. Uh, what I've done is, is I've prepared like a series of sort of at least hopefully thought-provoking questions that I would love to get your opinion on. Uh, I get to uh, be the first one to ask questions as a part of the post, but hopefully uh, the audience will have questions as we move along the process. So the way we, we can think about this from the perspective of kind of questions we can ask is the kind of stakeholders we have in this process. Uh, there are three stakeholders, according to me, mainly to think about this. One is uh, the technologists, uh, the folks who are trying to develop in uh, technology, not necessarily from a clinical perspective, think engineers, uh, think software developers, think robotics people. Then there are people who are what you would call on the clinical side of things, but who hold the keys on the clinical side of things, so surgeons. Uh, but not only surgeons, of course, uh, there are people who are in hospital management who are uh, who have the ability to sort of drive adoption through maybe change, um, let's say how insurance works uh, or or how we can sort of like actually make sure that the hospital is covered for trying out these new things, uh, right? So so the clinical uh, adopters. But the third thing which we should discuss and hopefully we'll get to is also uh, often the kind of stakeholders who usually do not get a seat at tables like this uh, today. It's the patient, right? Uh, does the patient get a say uh, in, in, in all of this, right? And uh, there have been recent studies actually, which showed that uh, sometimes the adoption is actually driven by patients. If patient tells you that I want to get a robotic uh, sort of, uh, a robotic uh, procedure for, let's say, uh, prostatectomy or something like that. Things that are more common, things that they are very likely to have heard about uh, from from their circle, uh, then that will drive adoption as well. Right? So if every patient wants the prostatectomy to be minimally invasive, laparoscopically done on a robot, because they believe they heard that that's the way it is done. So it, so anything that is done in the old school method is not going to sort of fly with them. Uh, so that's an yet another sort of, I would say, uh, mechanism that a technologist can sort of appeal to. So instead of directly appealing to clinical patients, the clinical persons, you can always go to the patient, market your product to the patient. Okay, so let's start from a technologist perspective uh, in, in terms of questions. Uh, in terms of technology itself, uh, from, from the kind of things, let's say, uh, the problems we need to be working on. As Vitor pointed out, remote procedures is uh, the next sort of set of challenges. But uh, I, would not, I would not argue remote procedures are new in that sense, right? Uh, there have been companies built on this idea for many years. What would you think are the big technological barriers uh, that uh, are in front of us in terms of, let's say, remote, to start with remote surgery first. Uh, so there, and it, there are of course different paradigms or different sort of specialties within surgery. Uh, and, and we can take the answers from, start from, from Vitter uh, because you started with neurosurgery, uh, but I'm sure there are uh, probably things that you might be able to mention about other specialties as well. Yeah, so thank you very much. This is a good point. Uh, I think today, if we, if we think about sur uh, robotic uh, surgery, uh, the biggest uh, uh, system that we have today that is widely used is the Da Vinci. And uh, abdominal, pelvic, thoracic surgery, some skull-based surgery, more than 70,000 surgeons operating and trained to be managing uh, hospitals, in US, some centers in Europe, they are surgical robo robotic surgical centers and they brand themselves as actually performing everything as most of the procedures that they can robotically. And uh, this is 
this is uh, uh, one system that is widely used. Then we have the spinal uh, robotics and uh, the orthopedic uh, robotics. We have a system called Mason to do knee surgery. It did increase uh, the safety and the value of robotic surgery uh, when the, the, you are performing knee surgery because they actually the robot prevent uh, the, some complications during the procedure that are often seen. So this is, this is a, a, probably one big domain, orthopedics, that is actually growing more and more. And in neurosurgery, we have the, the, the endovascular systems that are easier to, to adapt to robotics because we perform surgeries through the vessels. We don't need to do craniotomies or access the skull base. And then uh, this is something that recently has gained a lot of attention too. Uh, and in medicine, the way to convince surgeons to perform or to change their practice is actually by clinical studies. And we have examples of uh, stroke treatment, uh, cardiac or uh, angioplasties. They changed completely once we had a randomized study showing the value of it. And uh, you, you will have people like me that will be pioneers that, and you will have doctors that will be also waiting for this technology to use, don't need anything to convince. But the great majority of the physicians will actually wait for the clinical data or something that will demonstrate that it's safer or more effective to actually change their practice. So I, I think the next steps that once we have the good techniques is to actually move towards uh, producing value clinical data to actually demonstrate to the other group of physicians that don't have this pioneer drive to actually use and adapt it into the clinical settings. That's actually a good point. Um, before we move on to next questions, uh, I do want to sort of, uh, I'd love to hear uh, Tim and Naman's view as well uh, on the same sort of prompt, which is what according to you uh, would be game-changing technologies which let's say highest margin values? Um, <laughs> there, there's a lot to pick up on, on and uh, from Vitor's uh, comments there. Um, yeah, before maybe answering that question directly. Um, the, the example he gave of the Da Vinci systems uh, is a really interesting one. Spent a lot of time talking about that. Um, it, it, it actually started as, as a, a military was interested in, in tele, telesurgery. And um, one thing to, to, I guess, always keep in mind is, is um, with many of these hmm, procedures that we're, we're targeting with robotics, um, there, is, there is a way to deal with the current, you know, whatever the current paradigm is. There, there's, a, there's competition. It's not necessarily another robotic system. Uh, there are other procedures and ways to deal with um, uh, what, what's being done now. So the, the Da Vinci system is, um, is interesting in that it was conceived of as trying to bring healthcare closer to the, the front lines of, of a battlefield, because that's a critical time to treat to treat injuries. There's this concept of a golden hour, but you know, the, the closer you can bring treatment to the time of injury, the, the generally the better the outcomes. And so that was the kind of thought behind it. And um, the interesting thing is that the competition for that kind of paradigm, that system, that robot, that that concept is um, is actually the logistics of transporting people rapidly from the front lines to a, a care center that's a little bit further back that's better equipped. So those, those are the that's the thing that you have to uh, compete against. And you know as it turns out, um, military is pretty good at logistics and evacuating and it's actually pretty hard to bring that capability forward with all its sophistication. So um, it, it never really took off and got traction. There was a lot of um, development and interest in the 90s and and kind of that time frame, but it just it just didn't get anywhere. So that that was a barrier that um, um, that, they, that I don't think could really was overcome. And there are parallels in, in non-military applications for that kind of thing. That if if we think about remote surgery, we have to think about those issues too. You know, you're competing against what's done now, which is transporting the the, the smallest number of people that have maybe complicated uh, conditions that can't be treated in a in a more rural setting. But the other th interesting thing about the Da Vinci case is that it, um, um, it, it, 
it morphed. So that technology originally conceived of the military telepresence type surgery, it morphed to a different value proposition. And that value proposition was enhanced dexterity uh, for surgeons, whether it's thoracic or um, it, it, they're, they're really their first application that, that took off was uh, prostate surgery. And the, the enhanced dexterity that the robotic system could bring to prostate surgery actually made a difference although that's debated as well. but uh, And then the value of, of that, that difference uh, compared to the cost, that, that, that became the big debate, debate. but that's, that's really what enabled it. So fundamentally, it was a different value proposition um, that drove that technology to adoption. So it's an interesting case about what, um, you know, understanding the, the value that the robotic system or technology brings uh, to the healthcare system and then um, and making sure that you deliver on that. So that was, I, it was an interesting case to bring up because of all those those elements. Can, can I just uh, take take advantage of Tim's comment on the diverting and the prostate? And uh, uh, this is a, a, a an interesting topic. But since we could never, with a randomized setting, demonstrate the real benefit, yeah. that it it delayed the adoption, and the adoption also in, involves reimbursement. And everything in medicine moves forward with the, the correct reimbursement that you will get for that procedure. Yeah. And then if the system is not convinced and it will not reimburse for the robotic procedure, you will actually cannot expand the use of robotic for that particular case until you have that clinical favorable evidence-based scenario showing that it's superior to the yeah. regular practice. Yeah, and, and, and no, absolutely. And it's tough. So you you kind of, you know, mapped out the ado adoption kind of process of, you know, opinion leaders and clinical studies and, and um, getting evidence and then that adoption and, and the bulk of, of uh, you know, clinical adoption is somewhat conservative and justifiably so. Um, I would really be interested to hear Aman's um, comments on on that that process and how that that is actually it's 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 its own barrier to adoption that the length of that process the um the uh the funding that's required to enable that process um is is one of the barriers for kind of technology to um uh to make it from uh experiments and and, and demonstration in a research setting to uh commercial clinical use well i don't know if Amon's uh so Aman mentioned that uh, I think the connection uh, is is dropping. Yeah, so we can, we, can, we can wait for him to come back. Uh, I think that's actually a good point that both of you mentioned that particularly uh, sort of other forces such as, let's say, will the procedure be uh, reimbursed for the clinic uh, for the patient actually has a lot of effect in adoption completely. And uh, Stay stable. And, and then these uh, uh, independent, uh, independent um, randomized studies actually help, let's say, convince uh, insurance companies to be able to underwrite something like that. Uh, Aman is back with us today. <laughs> Aman. So uh, we would love to hear from you, Aman, uh, uh, if you can hear us uh, about what you would believe are sort of the major, uh, let's say, technological barriers or the kind of most biggest marginal technological gains to be had. Uh, Aman? Looks like he might be frozen again. I've, yes. uh, I've had Go this ahead. Yeah, I, I think, before. <laughs> yes, I think it happens. Uh, yeah. uh, so uh, while we are sort of waiting for Aman, um, I do have one thing to add and ask rather uh, to throw in the sort of like ring. Uh, often when we think of technology, uh, particularly robotics in healthcare, we always tend to focus on, uh, let's say, the elephant in the room, which would basically be uh, how can robots help in surgery? But uh, you could also argue that there's a lot of value to be had in non-surgical ancillary sort of help. So think telenursing, uh, think uh, diagnosis. Uh, and, and there are a number of these sort of hospital tasks that still require physical presence. So it's not purely what you would call um, go read x-rays kind of thing or go read sort of uh, test results, but actually 
helping patients uh, in in the in the front room, maybe doing uh, scrub tech stuff in the OR. Uh, and, so, and there are these tasks that uh, could really help uh, uh, the surgeon improve their own performance because this is the next level of technology. Maybe any comments on that? Iman, yeah. We believe you have Aman back. All right. <laughs> Absolutely. Go ahead. My yeah, apologies, we, everybody. Can you, we can threw you the ball okay? to you. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you now. We threw the ball over to you just as you as your uh, connection um, went. For <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. No, my apologies. And you know, we talk about um, remote surgery. Um, you know, one of the pitfalls is is establishing reliable connections in all different environments. Um, and so, yeah. You know, <laughs> Uh, well, well, good done. demonstration then. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> well done. I'm sure you very well staged this. <laughs> just, just as I had planned. Um, yep. So, you know, one of the other things, you know, as we talk about, you know, the, the challenges in, in developing this technology and, and Tim, my apologies, I didn't hear, um, uh, I kind of heard you intermittently as you, you were sort of uh, asking for, for my thoughts on things. So if I, if I get this wrong, um, please, uh, please do correct me. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the one of the major challenges of, of developing medical technologies is, you know, I, I've watched our company grow from, you know, a, a three, team, uh, three person purely R&D company to to, you know, uh, developing sort of commercial capabilities and dealing with um, uh, regulatory aspects and, and, and all of that, you know, when, when you and especially as uh, devices become more and more invasive, um, one of the challenges to have your your development team, your engineers, um, is is really the um, the fact that when you're developing commercial devices, you're developing an app, you're developing you know a lot of these other these other types of things. The people who are developing it can have um, you know a, a, a real feel for how end user. Um, Will, will work with it uh, because in many cases they are the end user or you know they're they're able to uh, prototype and test in in sort of real field settings and um, you know this disconnect between you know and you know trying to get that communication from the the real clinical need to to the development team to to build something um, it a lot can get lost in that translation and and you know we've we've constantly, um, uh, had that challenge, even though, you know, our, our CEO is an interventional cardiologist, um, you know, we have a lot of that clinical, clinical background and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, but just the fact that the people developing the technology will never be the ones that are actually using it. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty substantial barrier to overcome. And, uh, and you know, you really have to maximize that communication uh, by, by the, the end users and, and all the stakeholders, to be honest, um, you know, from, from, from the customer's perspective, from, from all those perspectives, right? Like a lot of engineers will think, you know, hey, I've got this lag time down to, you know, X milliseconds. And, and you know, from a technology perspective, that um, you know that that sort of response time, that lag time, makes all of the difference. Um, you know, and you know, one of my children had a had a birthday this uh, this weekend, and we had done this um, you know remote Zoom call, and you know everybody's trying to sing happy birthday in tune, and everything's off by just a little bit, and it just sounds like an absolute mess. Um, and you know, in absolute terms, that that lag or that gap is is very very minimal. Um, but in practical terms for, for the actual end use, it's, it's, um, it's a huge factor. Um, and so making sure that those requirements of um, either, you know, feedback time or, or, or lag or, or those kinds of things is, is absolutely critical and in, in making sure that that's clearly communicated. So I'm not sure if that answered what you were what you were asking of me, Tim. But uh, that is one one perspective that's become very clear to me over the years that uh, is is a challenge for developing invasive devices. I think that's actually a, uh, that's one definite sort of important perspective. So maybe maybe that sort of uh, is a perfect sort of segue into the next set of problems. So uh, one of the problems, as I've mentioned, is. Building robotics technologies or any sort of technologies for that matter, particularly for clinicians, is challenging uh, for scientists because two issues happen. 
One is it's very hard to think or sort of like think from the perspective of a clinician because they have a very specialized sort of uh, um, uh, training that let's say engineers may or may not have. An engineer may be biased to thinking only in terms of or with technological tools. Hey, this does sort of like, as someone mentioned, reduces lag or achieves certain sort of metrics and so on and so forth. Uh, how do we think about challenges in this particular setup where we know our adopters are famously conservative. Uh, uh, as uh, Vitor pointed, there are two things that, that we are sort of guiding against here. And, and I read about this in preparation for this is, there are two kinds of solutions you can build. I can build, I can look at what you're doing right now, Vitor, and say, okay, hey, uh, you are using a particular process right now. I will try to not change it or minimally change it, yet give you the sort of clinical advantage and outcomes or something, right? Uh, but if I'm trying to do something like radically different, right? So there's like, you will have to somehow stop this, whatever you're doing, and then move over. Uh, as uh, Tim was mentioning, right? That uh, even though you do this whole sort of process of uh, randomized training and all of that, at some point of time, there needs to be switch over, right? Even if other clinicians who are, may or may not be pioneers, we may sort of need to retrain a lot of people. And, and that comes with both sort of procedural cost, uh, a cost and rather uh, just a paradigm shift. So in that sense, but personally, I find what Intuitive has done even over a 20 year period seems remarkable because that's like super fast in those skills, right? They have changed the game only in 20 years rather than in 20 years. <laughs> so, uh, so I want to sort of ask all three of you, uh, what are both challenges and perhaps even solution strategies that have worked for for uh, for each of you in your own experiences? So I, I can start. I think from a, a physician perspective, uh, uh, to your comment before, other robotic uh, areas, either than surgically, will make robot uh, robots more present at the hospital. I think this is easier to implement. So. Uh, it took me two years to do the first brain surgery and uh, using a robot. And it took me a week to use a Doppler to and set up in the diagnostic area and get everybody used and trained to it. So I think having more robotics, uh, a tele companion, telepresence, as you mentioned, in the hospital or on the transportation, that helps just everybody at the hospital to get used to, to the adaptation of the technology. And to your point now regarding uh, the, 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 how uh, the, the physician, the, adop the adoption of the surgery itself, uh, we are very used to innovation. We are used to change to new devices and to be retrained. This is something that we are used to, but I think there is still a big barrier when we will cross the line towards robotics, because at least the feedback that I got when I did the first cases and everybody wanted to know how and, 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 and what was the, that kind of uh, technology, uh, the, what the physicians are afraid is the automation step. And what everybody is afraid is when it will become automated and I will not be necessary and this is some kind of probably that is in the back of the some conservative colleagues that will probably never uh, join the the robotic uh, evolution in, in medicine and in surgery, but we don't need them. I mean, these are like 10, 15% of people that will never change. But the great majority, I think, if we follow these steps, uh, and whenever they will have clinical evidence. We, we are used to change devices, to change procedures and to be retrained. So I think this, this is not a problem for at least the current uh, uh, surgical practice uh, in medicine. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting problem. Um, and yeah, there's the early adopters and companion leaders for sure. And, and you're right, I think the great, the, the majority of, of clinical practitioners, I mean, they attend conferences, they, they, uh, they technology and they're looking for the best way to take care of their, their patients. So that's, um, 
I think that's true. Um, but there is, yeah, there is a sweet spot. If, if you're, you know, introducing new technology, um, there is current practice. Like I said, you have to acknowledge that there's a current way of doing things. You want to be sufficiently differentiated that it's worthwhile making a change. If it's, if it's, you know, just marginally better, people aren't, there's an investment to be made in terms of retraining, changing the way you just go about your day. Um, so it has to be worthwhile to make that change, to learn a new thing. As I get older, I, I learn fewer and fewer new things. <laughs> Social media platforms come out and I, ah, I can't be bothered. Right? <laughs> there has to be enough of a benefit in order to drive adoption. So the flip side of that is too much uh, can be a problem as well. And uh, it, it has problems not only with you know, personal adoption, understanding and bringing it on board, but uh, the whole regulatory process, um, there is uh, infrastructure around um, not hmm, too much differentiation or introducing something that's, that's totally different from current medical practice uh, requires a different standard of evidence than something that is uh, an incremental improvement but doesn't fundamentally change the way um, current practice me medicine is delivered. Um, so, you know, even going to a regulatory body like the FDA, there's fundamentally different paths you can take and they have different timelines and they have different uh, evidence requirements and they have different costs. Um, so it, it's a balance between sufficient differentiation but not too much differentiation in order to, to have something that, that can be adopted and can be afforded um, for the benefit it brings. Anyway, I'll, I'll stop talking right now. <laughs> Maybe I'm, I'm on, you can chime in. Yeah, no, uh, you know, I actually like to build a little bit on what, what uh, Tim is saying because you're, you're absolutely correct. Um, you know, the, if you are going to change things drastically, it has to be a lot better. It can't be a little bit better. Um, and, you know, and then typically when you make that level of change, the cost in terms of actually proving outcomes is, is very substantial um, in terms of the required investment. Um, the, the regulatory process uh, especially in the U.S., where um, where you you have these very divergent uh, regulatory pathways, where it's sort of this this me too type situation, where it's like I'm substantially equivalent to to something else that's already out there, and there's a, a pretty substantially accelerated path going there, versus um, uh, versus going a complete new novel uh, technology that. Uh, you know, it, it's probably a factor of two or three in terms of the required investment to go down one path versus the other. Um, and so if you are, um, you know, if, if, if you are going to come up with a completely new workflow that's going to require completely new training, uh, potentially new, um, you know, capital expenditures, capital equipment, um, you know, uh, major changes to, to um, the operating theaters or the operating labs, um, it requires a huge amount of time and money and, uh, and commitment for, you know, before you can even get to the point of determining whether or not it's going to provide benefit. So um, there are these kind of divergent, um, you know, situations where, yeah, you can make incremental improvements and you can do them, you know, with relatively low burden, um, but they're only going to be incremental improvements. Um, so it, it, it's an absolutely massive consideration um, when you talk about the regulatory pathways. And I think even more so, you know, you talk about automating procedures. I think even, even bigger than that is, is the, the concept of AI, which, uh, you know, potentially has um, huge impact in, in the robotic space. Uh, but the, the regulators, to be quite honest and, and not to their fault, um, you know, don't really know how to regulate um, you know, the, the current structures of regulatory review and that process, it, it, it doesn't really, it, it isn't well suited for something like AI, right? It's all about, here's a deterministic thing um, that, you know, we are going to build it. This is how it's going to operate. This is how we can test it. Um, you know, where it's going to sort of learn and adapt and, um, and, uh, and sort of not be predictable in that way. Uh, is, a, is a very new, uh, I mean, it's not a new concept. We've been talking about this for, for decades, but in terms of how to sufficiently regulate that, it's, um, it, it's, it's a huge challenge. Um, so 
I, again, I, I don't want to be rambling about this, but uh, you know, there's uh, there's a lot of different considerations depending on the level of change that we're talking about. That's actually a very good comment, I would argue. Um, all three of you echoed this. Um, so the next sort of question I have here. Uh, so now it's on, I want to drive the conversation to make this sort of not just about uh, the problems, but also uh, not just the technical problems, but actually beyond that. So the first question I want to ask is uh, one of the things that, let's say, uh, these ideas of regulatory processes that enable adoption or that sort of uh, 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 go hand in hand with adoption. The outcomes of these regulatory processes have been very different in different ecosystems, despite uh, what you might say, uh, the availability of other factors. So let's say the same set of density of technologies are available in Europe, in Canada, and, and in the US. I would argue that uh, we in Toronto uh, have done better than average. There is a reason why Toronto and Ontario has a higher density of, uh, let's say, biomedical uh, companies uh, than other places. So maybe uh, just a commentary on, and maybe even we can pat ourselves on the back, what are we doing right and, and perhaps where can we improve? Yeah, so, I think, me too. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, the, the, this kind of uh, collaboration, uh, it's, uh, it's key to increase the dialogue and actually uh, make the development way faster. So I, we have a collaboration with Professor Sun and Rosalie since last year. And we have grown towards writing grants and working together. I think uh, we have to be closer uh, because uh, at the end, uh, the end user and the problems on the clinical side has to come together with the development to, to, to actually make a solution that will be impactful and will really change practice to then go to the other steps that we discussed before. I think uh, the, the close collaboration in industry and academic level between all the stakeholders, healthcare and, and the engineering team, I think it's key. And uh, I add also to the engineering team, the computer science and AI, because as Amon said, I think this will take a big part of the development of the new systems in the future. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I would I would agree with that. I think um, Toronto, yeah, if we want to pat ourselves on the back, we have a kind of a world uh, world class infrastructure uh, with uh, our educational institutions and the um, uh, the clinical practice that's all you know down on uh, College Street and that that interaction of of you know technical capabilities and clinical practice, you know, all all in such close proximity. Um, is, is critical to identifying problems and identifying technology that could potentially address those problems. Um, and uh, yeah, that interaction is, is, is really important. I wanna actually uh, maybe link this to, um, to, to a comment you made before. Like we've talked a lot about the kind of high profile um, applications for robotics, things like surgeries. Um, and and there, there are lots of people working on that, but this kind of, um, um, infrastructure uh, uh, facilitates, you know, kind of bringing out some of these other problems that may not be as, as um, obvious um, that there are good technical solutions. But uh, I think of like Toronto Rehab, for example, being there and, and some of the technologies there that robotics can have different value propositions depending on how you apply it. So, so it could be a, a very uh, high stakes intervention, like a brain surgery in which case that action has a high value associated with it and it has to be done precisely. And that's the value robotics brings. But the other value that robotics brings historically, um, uh, one of them is, um, is, is repetitive action. And they, those, those interactions could be perhaps of lower value individually, but the value of a robot is it could do things over and over and it doesn't mind doing things over and over. Uh, again, maybe in the, in the re rehab space or um, supporting people in, in, uh, in home care. Um, those value propositions for robotics um, might be, well, they, they come out when, when people can collaborate and talk to each other. And they also potentially have a, a, a lower burden in terms of regulatory pathway because they're, um, they're perhaps each, each of those transactions less risky 
um, you know, when a, when a robot's doing a, you know, maybe stroke rehab or something like that. Um, it's valuable, but in the, in the kind of cumulative uh, effect that the robotic system has interacting with the patient. So um, yeah, there, there are different uh, ways to, to think about this. Aman? Yeah, you know, in terms of what, uh, you know, talking about the, the community in, in Toronto, and uh, I, I absolutely agree that, you know, from a, you know, the, the technical schools in, in, you know, Southern Ontario are, are very, very strong. Um, and, you know, the, there's, a, there's a lot of really good um, research that goes on collaborations between, you know, um, you know, for, for early um, technical feasibility. I think where we where we struggle a little is in terms of that actual translation to um, to full full clinical um, you know uh, the, the the full cycle piece of it. You know, a lot of our technologies will get picked up by some of the larger companies, or um, but the, the innovation community in in Toronto and I think Canada in general isn't quite to the level that it is in you know some places uh, in the U.S. Or, or in other parts of the world. Um, where the investment community really gets, um, you know, the the long the, the long game of uh, of sort of medical technology development, um, you know, a, a lot of the you know, there's there's plenty of investment money in Canada, uh, but it's the the investor base is a lot um, more comfortable with the traditional um, uh, sort of traditional things. Uh, you know, it has been oil and gas, not so much anymore, but you know, real estate, um, you know, uh, consumption of natural resources and, um, and, and, you know, and, and to some extent, you know, a technology that's relatively low barrier to entry in terms of, you know, uh, app development and, and, and those kinds of things, but things that require these really large capital investments and don't see returns for a significant period of time um, are, 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 um, not not as well funded in, in Canada as they are in other parts of the world. In particular, you know, you look at obviously Silicon Valley or the Boston area, or uh, you know, a few others in uh, in Israel as well that uh, that sort of have this this sort of full cycle process for this type of technology. Technology. This actually is perfect segue. <laughs> I think you guys have preempted my questions to begin with. It seems. So the next question was, uh, so we have discussed this from a technology perspective, from, uh, from the perspective of like clinicians. One of the things particularly that may be relevant to the audience today, a large chunk of the audience today is students. Students who have uh, worked on these problems or are working on these problems for their grad careers. Now, one of the issues that is a very practical issue is, a lot of professors and teams are working on this, but that work actually gets done at the quanta of, let's say, a grad student lifetime. A grad student lifetime is maybe four or five years uh, in, in, the, in the sort of like process. Even if I'm very focused, I have discovered the problem early on in my career, often the outcome of my PhD uh, will be evaluated on the impact of the work that I've done, right? So if I've, if I've chosen a problem, uh, where I was able to do some sort of very initial feasibility study, then, uh, but I'm not able to actually convince after graduation that, hey, look, this is a very cool thing to be doing. And I'm not interested in startup, but finding opportunities, whether in companies or other small startups, that I have the right experience and the right, uh, let's say, training to do interesting stuff. Uh, it's very hard or challenging for, for students in the space to showcase the impact of their work because of the lengthy timescales of these processes. How or what can we do as, let's say, holders of the keys from perspective of the like industrial sort of setup from perspective of the clinicians and, and, and maybe uh, guidance to us as faculty, uh, what can we do here to improve outcomes? How do we align incentives such that in progress happens at the quanta of their sort of lifetime where they have uh, they have uh, things to sort of show when they step out of the step out of the process to, to get next set of opportunities. Yeah, from uh, I, I think from a, a, a end user on the healthcare side, I think 
there is a, a number of different opportunities. This is probably the perfect time to jump into the field because uh, you know it's everything is yet to be developed. So there is a number of ideas on how you can innovate, explore. Our focus has been and will be on treating stroke remotely. That's everything to 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 set. I think if I encourage the students to get uh, involved in the projects and understand these nuances that we discussed here that touch robotics in the healthcare system. But then after it will open your door to you know startups that will come out of some of these projects or other ones that will certainly be formed uh, to actually uh, have uh, uh, at least some of the challenge that we, we we will face, like remote surgery, data transmission, AI implementation in the robotic systems. I think this yet to develop, there's probably not a better time to be in than now. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> Very good question. Um, I, I don't know if I've got the right answer, but um, a couple of a couple of thoughts maybe. So I, I work for an aerospace company. I've noticed, <laughs> and um, uh, I've always been interested in robotics. Um, and I started out working on robots for for space, you know, the space station and, and and things like that. And within the same company, um, I looked at translating that technology to um, uh, to healthcare. And the key there is, is, I mean, there's domain knowledge for sure that you need, um, but understanding, you know, hmm, at a basic level about understanding technology and understanding it enough um, to figure out how to apply it intelligently to solve problems, uh, to do that translation that I'm almost talking about, um, understanding whatever the problem, whatever domain it's in, uh, whether it's, um, you know, healthcare or, or you know, it could be nuclear power or you know, wherever robotics are, if we stick with the robotics theme, um, understanding how to intelligently apply that technology to solve a problem is, um, is, is the skill that, that you know, I, I would look for um, uh, in, in people graduating. Uh, yeah, it's, it's sometimes difficult in that timeline to, to go end to end um, uh, for something, but, uh, you know, kind of understanding the, um, how, how it all works. The reason I mentioned the aerospace thing is, is, um, is, is in my experience, I've had, you know, myself going from, from aerospace to, to looking at healthcare, but there's been a lot of translation in, you know, my, my the people that I know <laughs> uh, have gone back and forth between those industries. And it, it, it says that there, there's a lot of translatable skills. And so, you know, what, what under, underlies that, you know, it's, it's not necessarily the, the actual technology you're working on, um, you know, in, in kind of the, the, the manifestation that you're working on it in your grad, you know, thesis, but um, it's the methodologies and the processes that you go through when you're doing that. Uh, those are translatable um, to, to different, not to say you need to translate industries, but um, it's, it makes it applicable in a whole bunch of, even within clinical uh, practice, um, there's all kinds of things that can happen and just understanding the, um, the values that uh, that the technology can bring um, will make you as a as a graduate uh, valuable. Hope, hope that's helpful. <laughs> that's... No, I think definitely. I think uh, these opinions, uh, of course, are not necessarily definitive final answers, but they're actually very helpful uh, in both guiding students. Hopefully, all of the students here are taking notes on how to pick problems, what would be useful, and, and, uh, and to also give them assurance that what, what they're doing uh, is not necessarily sort of, uh, often particularly in this space feels very hard because I don't see the impact of my work in sort of like my academic lifetime, as in like my academic lifetime during my training, of course. Uh, so Aman uh, as well, go ahead. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it, you know, I, I think Tim and I probably both uh, had the same struggle in answering this question because it's, it, it is a very difficult, uh, it's a very difficult thing with the, the relatively long development life cycles and, you know, especially, you know, a company like, like ours where, you know, we're looking to bring in people that have experience and it's that classic 
catch 22 of like how do you get the experience if you you know if everybody's looking for that experience um sort of walking in the door um so it you know i, I think the best answer that we found you know we've been very active in the um in the internship programs um and uh and you know we've had some pretty good success having you know really you know really bright bright young people come in and uh you know do do really good work and and um and then you know come back and, and join us as full-time employees after they after they graduate um you know for, for us that's probably been the most effective sort of way of working with uh with with students and you know we've tried you know working on some capstone projects and that and you know with some with some success but it, you know it is uh it, it's a lot more limited in in terms of the scope of it so it's it's not sort of that immersive experience that um that i think the internship programs provide um you know one thing you know for for the universities and i think u of t generally does a good job of this is um especially with with things like medical technology development or, or robotics or what have you um the four month sort of co-op terms are not enough and there's so much ramp up time to to understand the processes to you know there, there's sort of um the, this uh you know quality systems uh uh oversight that that you know all of our companies need to, to need to adhere to um you know all of that takes a significant amount of of ramp up and overhead um and so you know these the four month terms or even the eight month terms i think are are pretty short for that so i really think the 12 to 16 month uh terms are, are, are the most effective for that um and you know we've seen some some pretty good success on on that and had really good contributions from from people coming in on on those types of programs um you know and and as much as i you know i've just said that you know the four month terms aren't uh, aren't uh, long enough I, I do think those are also very useful in terms of getting students exposed to different atmospheres um you know you know tim tim had talked about uh you know moving from from aerospace to, to medical i'd actually done a, a co-op term with uh with mda almost maybe 20 years ago um and uh, and so it was part of my, my my development path as well so you know i think having exposure to 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 different fields that um you know that that have translatable skills is is of high value uh but you know it, it's absolutely a difficult question of you know these these technologies take a very long time to develop. You've got these sort of smaller windows in which you, you know, you, you can, uh, you know, you can enter through different programs. Um, and and how do you how do you get that all to match? It's it's a very difficult problem for sure. I would like to sort of like follow up on this thread. Uh, so I'm risking running into uh, the break time, but this is uh, a conversation that I'm. You can tell perhaps I'm having too much fun asking. Uh, questions. Uh, maybe, maybe let me ask you a question from a very sort of student's perspective, being a student kind of thing, very recently rather. So this is a problem that appears very often, as Aman pointed out, right? Four months seems to be too short because the bring up uh, time is actually uh, non-trivial. So what is one or two skills, not just, and this is a problem, not just in, let's say, people trying to join industry, actually. This is actually a problem also when people, when students join labs doing particular kinds of projects, right? Uh, uh, maybe what are, and then this includes you Vita, as well. Uh, when you are trying to, let's say, start working with collaborators, let's say you said you are working with Sun and, and Rosalie, uh, and most likely there's a, a one or two students involved in that process. What could they learn before they start research in terms of, let's say, technology, or maybe something about anatomy. I, I remember my time when I was doing this, I was working on uh, particular kinds of like radiation oncology. And I really felt that I needed to go back to school to understand sort of anatomy <laughs> to do anything meaningful. Uh, so uh, because a lot of these uh, students that, that are here today are actually engineers, uh, what could they learn like in terms of core skills that would make them sort of hit the ground running in terms of doing research or, or doing technology development. So if you could sort of point out one or two things, maybe it could be like, go study anatomy because that's something that is taught to medical students, but never to engineering students or something like that. Vitor, you are, you are uh, muted. 
So you don't need to do all the anatomy. It's like almost one and a half years, just for, and half of half a day oh. per, per of studies. But I think you need to understand at least from the 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 problem that you are trying to solve, the anatomy and the clinical perspective that that involves that specialty or that particularly problem. And the first thing we do here is I invite them here to come to the hospital, the students uh, that we've been working together. Or our son came multiple times when we were talking about our, our projects. And uh, the first thing that I like is, is to bring them to see a procedure and we discuss the anatomy specifically on that domain. And they have to see the, the, the surgical area where the, the procedure is performed before they visualize everything that they have actually to design. And what I see is a lot when they come and they, they see the table. Oh, the table is, is very narrow. It's, I, I cannot put my prototype here. I have to stay in this side and not in the other side. So I, I think and part of the problem problem solving uh, uh, process it has to be knowing the field knowing where uh, the uh, the procedure or the area that you will apply robotics in the hospital is is actually uh, being performed and then if it's a surgery then knowing the anatomy that is important but that can be studied after once you start this connection uh, with the clinician or with the hospital team that will actually be explaining you the clinical context that you will be trying to help with a robot. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's a that's a question. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I'm, I'm going to try to maybe generalize. Uh, uh, maybe not the, the right thing. Um, Vito, yeah, you you had some very good kind of you know the practices of of how you you know engage someone and bring someone on board and how they get up to speed and then can start to make contributions you know faster than than, than maybe otherwise possible. Um, from from a, I, I was an engineering student. Um, engineers like to be their problem solvers. You know they like to see a problem and and, and uh, try to solve it. Um, I, I, the only perspective maybe that I, I want to share that I, I've gained over time is early on in my career, I would, I would look for a solution and I would try to define a solution right away and jump to that solution. And um, I think when you move into uh, a place where there is a problem and you're looking to apply technology like, like robotics, um, try to avoid jumping right to a solution, like a point in the solution space and try to take time to understand the, the, the problem, the dimensions of the problem, and the characteristics of a solution. And then you can define what a solution might, might look like. Um, so just trying to follow that, that process. I know it sounds like maybe you're going slower than, you know, I know what the answer is and I'm gonna, you know, just go there. <laughs> um, that's a natural ten temptation. And um, I think that's something as uh, over time and over my career that I tried to keep that perspective. Um, it's not always easy, but uh, <laughs> that's, uh, um, so when you go into, a, as an engineer going into a clinical space and trying to define, uh, understand that problem, you know, it, that the interaction that you were talking about, um, you know, observing what goes on, asking about, you know, anatomy and, 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 you know, what's going on in your mind and doing that translation that Aman was talking about earlier, that's so difficult to do. Um, understanding and being, being able to do that process is really valuable. So that's a skill maybe to, to work on. I, I fully agree, I fully agree. And I would encourage the students to develop that, this process of interviewing, of getting that right. Uh, you know, we don't, we in medicine, we have many problems. We are specialists on creating and studying problems and we don't have necessarily a solution. So I understand your perspective that you think already, I need a solution and I need to get there. In medicine, we have problems that we will never find a solution or we will have partial solutions along the time. And that is a, a, a good understanding for an engineer that will be dealing with a problem because he may not find a complete solution, but there will be partial solutions over time. 
may be philosophical, but that's that's some yeah. We we don't have a solution for most of the problems we see in medicine. That's an interesting perspective. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's comforting actually in some ways. <laughs> uh, so so we have many questions uh, today from the audience. We may not be able to get to many questions uh, today, but I do want to sort of uh, ask one question as we close this session, uh, but I would want uh, sort of, uh, so the one interesting question that came to us from, uh, I don't know if I'm saying the name correctly, Puyuan, uh, the, the question goes something like, along the lines of how, does a grad student think about creating, let's say, uh, a technological startup in this space, especially with respect to two challenges? And I'm adding my own spice to the question. One, long technological development cycle. So creating startups in this kind of space may be trickier. And two, uh, where they may exist mature companies with deeper pockets. Uh, so, so how does one go about that? And I think that's a very sort of hard question to answer. So I will not sort of put any of you on spot, but feel free to answer whoever wants to. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately there, you know, ha having gone through some of that, <laughs> um, I, I don't think there's unfortunately an easy answer and it's, it's really about just immersing yourself in it um, and, you know, from prototyping, you know, when, when we were developing the, the early prototypes for, for Canavi uh, or what at the time was uh, Calibri Technologies, um, you know, the, the, our current CEO and myself were the, the two primary co-founders, you know, we were literally, you know, spending evenings and weekends in his parents' basement um, building prototypes or we were, you know, we were, we were writing patents or we were, you know, applying for, you know, proof of principle grants um, and, and those types of things. You know, it, it is it is a lot of legwork. It is you know speaking to whatever mentors you have in your network or developing mentors in your network. Um, you know, working with uh, you know the the innovation support groups with within the university, um, and uh, and and getting whatever guidance you can um, from from the mentors that are available to you. But also, unfortunately, just putting in the work. It's it's there's. There's no, there's no easy answer. You really just have to immerse yourself in it. One, one, uh, one thing, I, I, and I'm on. I'd be interested in your thoughts on, on this one too. Um, I was kind of, as developers of technology, I, I, you know, I always thought that was the the thing. Um, and I was kind of humbled at at some point when going to investors to um, to enable your company. Um, that you get the, the the first questions aren't necessarily about the the you know, the, the details of the technology, <laughs> so you know let's put that to one side. You know, of course it's important, and you know technology has to be there and work and stuff like that. But it's not the end of end of it, and it's actually not where if you're thinking about investment anyway, it's not generally where the conversation starts, or it, it very quickly goes to okay, what is you know the the stakeholders, what is their um, the value proposition to the the patient to the uh, the healthcare provider, um, you know, whether it's a hospital administrator or an insurance provider, is a reimbursement. All these these kind of questions that, um, you know, you're they're, they're not as sexy maybe, but <laughs> in terms of technology, but um, they come up very quickly. And uh, yeah, it's some you put a lot of hard work in developing technology, and then you're, um, yeah, I don't know, part part of your brain thinks that that well, that's it. You know, aren't you? It's obviously has a benefit, and <laughs> there's more to it apparently. <laughs> No, you are 100% correct about that, right? Like if you, you know, get into a room, you know, either presenting to, you know, there's, there's a number of competitions or, or things like that where, you know, um, for, for startups or, or for, for um, just, you know, communities of investors that, that come to see what's sort of out there, you know, one of the first questions you'll, you'll always be asked is, you know, um, who's going to pay for this, right? Like, why would anybody pay for this? What is what is your reimbursement strategy? Like they'll, they'll you know, you should expect to know everything about the the DRG DRG codes associated with uh, with the procedure that you're 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 uh, potentially influencing. Like, um, you know, is is it reimbursed? What's the what's the pathway for for that? What's the regulatory pathway? Um, you know, how what does your um, you know proof of outcomes 
look like? What's the literature say about these types of things? It's it's so much more than having the technology. Like you said, that's that's almost a, it's not a given because it's a very difficult part of it. They, and, and you know that's it requires real sort of ingenuity and innovation. Um, but it is only a part of it, uh, and uh, and you will very quickly, very very quickly, be asked about all the other aspects of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I don't so, want to dim diminish that, but it's uh, it's kind of like table stakes. You don't get into the room without that. But then, like you say, it then then you have to deal with all the other the next level <laughs> questions. That's wonderful. I think this has been a wonderful freewheeling sort of discussion. I have personally enjoyed this very much. I would like to thank all three of our panelists, with our team and Aman, for being such good sport about uh, about fielding questions that were sort of, I would argue, left the field. <laughs> but uh, uh, that said, I would like to also thank all of the organizers uh, for this session. And we have a wonderful program ahead of us uh, in the next sessions. I would like to invite all three of you to attend uh, the Q&A and the networking session uh, this afternoon at 12 to 1, if your time and schedule permits, of course. Uh, hopefully, some of our students uh, and other members of the community would like to ask you more sort of open-ended questions uh, about topics that we discussed today. Uh, so it'll be lovely to have you there as well. Uh, and thank you again. Thanks, thanks, Rosalie. And I believe over to Kimberly for the yes. next part of the schedule. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. Um, thanks, Dylan, you, thank you so much, panel.